It's early in season four of the Death Dhamma podcast. It's March, and we are on episode five. Yet something tells me that as we move forward and speak with people who help others alleviate their suffering, that they will mention compassion as part of their motivation. And if they don't say it outright, it's likely to be implied. Hi, it's Margaret Maloney, and welcome to the Death Dhamma podcast. I'm a Buddhist practitioner out here in the world, having experienced the loss of my loved ones and knowing how much my Buddhist practice helped me on my grief journey. And now together we have this safe space to discuss death, dying, grief, and the Buddhist teachings that help us really understand attachment, impermanence, being compassionate, being death ready, what it means to live a life so that we can have a peaceful death. Yep, it's a big topic, and we're going to take it on together. Let's go. Once upon a time, one of my professors told me that there was no such thing as compassion in Theravada Buddhism. He said that I would not find any evidence of compassion in the Pali Canon. I was shocked and saddened, but eventually I became suspicious. This just did not ring true. There's no compassion in the Pali Canon. No teachings of compassion in Theravada Buddhism? Come on! This stuck with me, and eventually I was able to conduct my own research. Spoiler alert, yes, there is compassion, and people can be helping others because they are motivated by compassion. When I say compassion, I mean that they see that someone is suffering, and through empathy, they know what that is like to be suffering and they are moved to take action to help diminish that suffering. This example from the Anguttara Nikaya helps to illustrate this definition. Suppose a sick, afflicted, gravely ill person was traveling along a highway, and the last village behind him and the next village ahead of him were both far away. He would not obtain suitable food and medicine or a qualified attendant. He would not get to meet the leader of the village district, Another man traveling along the highway might see him and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy, and tender concern for him, thinking, oh, may this man obtain suitable food, suitable medicine, and a qualified attendant. Now, noticing the ill person traveling along the highway is not compassion. Wishing that he is free from suffering, that is compassion. The Buddha expects that his monks will engage in compassionate behavior and chastises them if they do not. Both Sariputta and Ananda are admonished by the Buddha when he finds them lacking. Sariputta, for not giving proper guidance to a group of a few monks, some new monks, and Ananda for not defending Sariputta when he's being verbally harassed by someone else. Anganakara 4-95 and Anganakara 4-98, both recognize that some people do practice only for themselves, while others practice for themselves and and for others too. And in a previous episode, we did talk about the myth of selfishness in Buddhism, but that doesn't mean that some human beings are not selfish because they are. Well, in these passages, four types of practitioners are listed like this. Bhikkhus, there are these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What for? One who is practicing for his own welfare, but not for the welfare of others. Or, number two, one who is practicing for the welfare of others, but not for his own welfare. Or, number three, one who is practicing neither for his own welfare, nor for the welfare of others. And number four, one who is practicing both for his own welfare and for the welfare of others. The person who practices not for himself and not for others is compared to a piece of wood that is not useful in either the village or the forest. The person who practices only for the good of others is better than the one who practices just for himself. The person who practices for himself but not for the benefit of others is better than the first two. However, as you would have guessed, it's the person who practices for the benefit of himself 
and for others that is a superior individual. Despite the fact that compassion is not the primary teaching of the Buddha, the theme of compassion is ever present. In most teachings, compassion is an assumed behavior, especially for monks. To be a monk is to be compassionate. The Karuna Sutta specifically discusses how developing and cultivating the perception of compassion leads to great benefit. Karuna, bhikkhuwe, bhavati, or bhikkhus, when compassion is developed, is the phrase. The development of compassion is of great fruit. So when it's developed, it is of great fruit. It leads to great good, security from bondage, a sense of urgency, and dwelling comfort. So in this passion, in this passage, pardon me, compassion is just one of the states to be developed. In the Majjhima Nikaya 103.1, the Kinti Sutta, the Buddha asks the monks to tell him why they think he teaches the Dhamma. The monks reply, the blessed one is compassionate and seeks our welfare. He teaches the Dhamma out of compassion. In the connected discourses with Kasapa, Venerable Maha Kasapa shares why he continues to meditate in the forest. He's saying, For myself, I see a pleasant dwelling in this very life, and I have compassion for later generations thinking, may those of later generations follow my example. Later, in that same sutta, the Buddha says to Venerable Maha Kasapa, Good, good, Kasapa. You are practicing for the welfare and happiness of the multitude out of compassion for the world, for the good, welfare, and happiness of the divas and humans. So meditating and taking himself away to the forest for the right reasons is an act of compassion. I think it's important to stop and point out that in early Buddhism, Meditating for someone, sending them loving kindness, dwelling in compassion, thinking of them compassionately, that is a type of action, just as your thoughts contribute to your karma, remember karma meaning action, that also means that your thoughts, your meditations, your contemplations can be a form of compassion, where compassion is active. There are many passages that mention, you know, that a new monk has to be compassionate, that it's one of the most important things a new monk does. Here's one. Again, I'm turning to the Enga Nikara Nikaya. Having offered the teacher's fee to his teacher, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on okra robes, and goes forth from the household into homelessness. When he has gone forth, He dwells, pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter, above, below, across, and everywhere. So in other words, you know, a monk sits and contemplates and sends these thoughts of loving kindness out in all imaginable directions. So to all as to himself, he dwells, pervading the entire world, with a mind imbued with loving kindness, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity, without ill will. He dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. And then the the passage is repeated again with dwelling in compassion and again pervading compassion in all directions. Or another passage from the Manijima Nikaya, the Khandaraka Sukta states, Having thus gone forth and possessing the bhikkhu's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing. With rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Respectfully, I consider monks dwelling in compassion to be part of monk 101. In other words, like this is entry level. If you're going to be a monk, you need to be able to do this And this is one of the first things that you are directed to do, to be able to dwell in compassion and also loving kindness and sympathetic joy and equanimity. This is what is required for a monk to move forward. It enables a monk 
the ability, it gives a monk the ability to release hostility that, you know, um, he might be hanging on to towards others. And this release of hostility is really what allows him to move closer to enlightenment. Enlightened beings are not walking around with resentments towards others. Now, we are not monks and nuns, at least I'm not, but I see the value of Monk 101 for all of us. This ability to view others through the eyes of compassion is critical to our own progress on the path. And returning to our theme for this season, our ability to be rooted in compassion helps us perform the work that helps others find a way out of their suffering. I've got books for you, starting with Carpooling with Death, How Living with Death Will Make You Stronger, Wiser, and Fearless, the book that got me going and helped me to discuss going through the death of my loved ones, followed by Sitting with Death, Buddhist insights to help you face your fears and live a peaceful life, based on season one of the Death Dhamma podcast, and just recently, Enlightenment Unleashed, how your pet can lead you to spiritual transformation because during our lifetime, we may see the rising and ceasing of many pets, and we love them like they are our family. Find these on Amazon.com or come see me at MargaretMaloney.com. You've been listening to the Death Dhamma Podcast with your host, Margaret Maloney. Thank you so much for being here. Come find me on MargaretMaloney.com, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-M-E-L-O-N-I.com. And until we meet again, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at ease, and may you be free from suffering. Bye for now.